Hi, Scissor in here with another episode of Path of Exile University. And today we are going to be talking about advanced mechanics. We do have a disclaimer at the start because of the manifesto changes for 3.16. Uh, it's shuffled a lot of things around. In fact, poor Araki, everything in this lesson had to be like rewritten at the last minute because, well, our renovation got massive changes, right? So all the information uh, is we were going to share and talk about all the proposed changes, but GGD also stated in their um, in their announcements that everything isn't final, right? That it's going to be updated based on our feedback. Um, but we're going to teach uh, generally how things work and how we think they're going to work and uh, move forward with that, which honestly, I don't think it'll be changed. But these things were changed. Evasion, armor, blind, dodge, mana restoration, and spell suppression. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, in this class, is going to be covering advanced tips on the game and mechanics, user interface, tooltips, critical strike chance, hit chance, hit chance and how uh, it affects critical strike chance, armor, evasion, spell dodge, block and glancing blows, mana restoration changes, and order of operations for receiving damage. And this is actually very important. I actually died just because of that one. So... GGD is against UI modifications. If you've played other games such as World of Warcraft, then you might be used to, you know, just being able to have like loads of raid UIs and, and loads of different things on your screen. You cannot do that here in Path of Exile. Um, it is all static. And uh, the default tooltips are very lacking in advanced information. And if you go to options, UI, and then scroll down, you'll find a thing that says advanced mod descriptions. This is very important because it lets you show like what tier, for example, different mods are. So whether it's tier one or tier seven life. Um, the gray text that might seem like flavor text. If you look at, for example, you know, a, a good example is a jeweler or fusing. On a jeweler or fusing orb, it'll actually explain to you that the higher the quality of the item, the easier it is to link. Um, people haven't read that, so sometimes people think streamers are joking when they say that, but it actually says on the orb itself. Maps will also tell you how to use them. Jewels tell you how to use them. Watchstones, etc. Like, it's not just flavor text. Um, and reading is hard. I would know. Um, that's sort of my thing. I've died to not reading several times. But uh, yeah, make sure you read it. And same with several gems as well. will also tell you what does and doesn't work. Sometimes people will be like, Oh, wouldn't Unleash be really good on this? Well, it's like, well, it doesn't work with triggered gems, right? It's a very easy thing to miss. Um... And yeah, and word order doesn't necessarily matter, but exact wording does. And uh, holding alt on everything would generally give you more information. Things like item level and just advanced tooltips, a lot more stuff. They'll show you the modifier range, uh, unscalable values, or what is scalable or divinable. There's tiers, tags, fortified gem explanation. It'll show you things like what skill gem quality does. Um, it'll show you things like anoints, like, uh, holding, holding alt on the skill tree will show you what anoints for each node. So if you open up the passive skill tree and click that, you'll see. Um, keyword explanations on items. Sometimes there'll be a, a unique item that maybe has a keystone. So holding alt will show you that as well. Ailment avoidance, elusive, onslaught, maps. Holding alt on maps is really good. It'll show you completion status. And whether you've only completed like that it's droppable, whether you got the bonus or the awakened bonus. Um, jewelry quality, for example. Uh, like if you do 1% quality on a jewelry, it'll show you like what actually gets affected by it. So whether you do life, chaos, or crit, etc. Um, nearby, however, is the least informative mod description that Path of Exile ever uses. Nearby literally means from this close to this far away. I don't know why they don't just use like a, a set range, like from 30, 30 range or 50 range, because then we would start getting like used to some sort of variable like, oh, okay, this is 30 range, but this one is 60. Um, so it's very, very weird. Like, I, I don't know why they use it. Yeah, it's like, it, it's just any metric. Um, Whereas it's weird because something like recently is always the same. Four seconds. And I wish nearby was... Yeah. 
Uh, and yeah, hold alt when you're not sure on what something is. There's a high chance that'll help in generally everything. Whoops. I need to skip one. So, crit chance. Crit chance works differently from spells and attacks, but it's basically your base crit plus the sum of your added crit uh, multiplied by one plus the sum of your uh, increased crit. And the way this basically ends up working, um, a, a good thing that people would like get confused on before was how control destruction used to be or whenever something says 100% reduced critical strike chance. Um, and, and that's not the same as uh, something like Resolute Technique, like no critical strike chance. And um, the easy example here is, well, if you put on a shield with 100% increased critical strike chance, you don't, you don't always crit, do you? And the reason for that is because of how base crit and added crit works. So let's give some actual examples. So let's say that you have, um, let's say you have a spell, a 6% base crit. And it'll say on the gem, like every spell gem will have a base crit. So for example, Fireball. So Fireball might have, I can't remember Fireball's exact value, but let's say it's 6%. And now if you have no spell crit at all, you have 6% crit. If you get 100%, you have 12%. If you get 200%, you would have 18%, etc. And that's why base crit is so good and things like the increased critical strikes gem. Because if you then have 8% crit and you have 200% crit, you would get, uh, or sorry, 100% crit, you would have 16. So everything is based off your base crit. And then on weapons, you will see that, um, for example, if you have a siege axe or something, that'll say 5% crit chance. Um, and if you then get the, the suffix, increased critical strike chance, which is a local thing, that would put the base crit up towards like 9%. And the higher the base crit is, the easier and more effective all your other sources of increased crit is, so they feed into each other. Um, and then yeah, added flat critical strike chance is additive with base crit. So like brittle is hits against you have additional crit chance up to 15% flat, but you lose chill and freeze. But brittle can be really, really strong for getting close to 100% crit. Very, very easy with that. Um, there are some sources. I think there's still some sources left in the game with like lucky crit chance. Uh, Diamond Fast used to be lucky. I think that's a good thing that got nerfed because we would just get like 60-70% crit and call it a day. Now, because it's very, very hard to get lucky crit now, I think it's just a Maraketh jewel that does it, and it's while you're blinded or something, then um, um, then you, uh, yeah, you it'll roll your crit twice. But without that, you really want to get close to 100, honestly. And it feels amazing if you can get 100. Now, do remember, some things aren't shown in the tooltip. For example, Assassin's Mark on the enemy, right, won't show up in your end. So you would have to calculate that with third parties like Path of Building. And uh, back to Brittle, it scales with the size of the hit against the monster's ailment threshold. And it's very easy to scale to decent levels if you're willing to lose chill and freeze. It's very strong for getting crit cap, which is 100%. Like, you can get 100% now. Added flat critical strike chance is additive with the base crit. So hits against enemies have plus percentage chance of crit chance. So Assassin's Mark, for example, that will add to your actual base crit. It's very strong. Other strong modes as well as like on Elder or Hunter Armors or Shaper or Crusader, they will have like base crit chance as well. There are some items and corruptions as well that will have um, Val Implicits. Some have Socketed have crit chance and some just have Global crit chance. And paying attention to whether it's Socketed or Global is uh, very, very important as well. And increased critical strike support is just 2% crit chance. Very, very strong. And obviously, if you're able to avoid using the increased critical strike support base gem, you get a lot more damage, right? If you're able to get that from something else. Um, and yeah, the most abundant sources, the passive tree is going to be a lot of it. You can get it on Diamond Flask. It's still worth using. And remember that from Katarina, unless they're changing in this patch, but from Katarina, you can unveil critical strike chance for Flask as well. And... Normally, you would unveil that on a Cinder Swallow, and a lot of people forget that once you've unveiled it on a Cinder Swallow, you can craft it on any other flask. So, it's not just a one-time unveil that only goes on that. So, it is a, a very, very good thing. And then we have Global Critical Strike Chance, and that works regardless whether you're spouse or attack. And then, it's added it with other sources of increased Critical Strike Chance. 
and um, there will be increased critical strike chance against enemies on X, which is additive with increased crit. So, for example, Bottle Faith, uh, very, very strong. A lot of damage. And Bottle Faith, even without the crit portion, just the enemies taking increased damage is incredibly strong. Here we have some examples. Twilight Blade, Blade has a 5% base crit chance and then 1.5% from Assassin's Mark and you have a total of 700% increased critical strike chance. Then we'll have the 5 plus 1.5% so you will have a total of 6.5 and that will get multiplied by the well 1.7 basically. So this would end up giving us the um, 6.5 multiplied by 8 equals 52% crit chance. And then if we were back in the day here where we had the diamond flask being lucky, that would already be very playable, right? Um, the, the big really silver lining about diamond flask being nerfed is bosses would very often feel bad on crit builds before because you would run out of your diamond flask. So it's actually a good thing that we now really are incentivized to build 100% crit. Prophecy 1 has 8% base chance and then we have 1.5 from Assassin's Mark against the boss and uh, 700 and now it would be 9.5 multiplied by 8 for 76 and now you can really see how important the base crit is because we have the same amount of crit but just that like two point or actually just two more base crit that gives us 24 percent more crit that is a very large amount from just a little bit of base crit so yeah really really big amount okay and here we have 8 base crit weapon for, uh, we have an Elder Chest with 1.5, 2 from the Increased Strike Support, 1.5 from Assassin's Mark. Oh yeah, 3 times more. Um, wait. Yes, you're right, 3. 3 more. Wow, I shouldn't be a teacher. 3 more. It's early. Anyway, back to the uh, Elder Weapon example. 1.5 from Assassin's Mark and 700% again, right? Here we have... 13 base crit and that puts us at 104% crit chance now going over going over is not like it doesn't give you anything there are some games that have like you know if you have 200% poison chance it would do two poisons that is not the case in path of exile going over 100% is just it gets rounded out it does nothing and the value is over 100%, so you always deal a critical strike against enemies, which are not immune to crit, and uh, as long as they can be cursed by Assassin's Mark. So uniques and rares, and that's where it really matters. Everything else is going to fall over anyway. Here's another chance. Here we have 8% base crit, 15% brittle, Elder Chest, 2% from the Increased Strike Support, 1.5 Assassin's Mark, but we only have 280% total Increased Strike Chance. Right? But here you can see the insane amount of base crit we have. And yeah, the 28 multiplied by 3.8, we have 106 crit here. With barely any investment. Barely any investment from increased critical strike chance. It's literally all in the base. And uh, the Slayer Ascendancy Overwhelm, it puts your base crit for weapons to 8%. But that means that every weapon, even if it's better than that, is 8%. So for example, if you have a 9.6% base crit weapon and take this, you're nerfing your weapon. You're better off not using it. Now, hit chance is actually very important for crits, but only if you're using attacks. And if you miss, you cannot proc on hit effects. And hit is calculated against enemy evasion rating only. And it's calculated from your accuracy. And that's capped at 100%. But it ends up being that if you don't have 100% chance to hit, you're effectively lowering your crit chance. Um, actually, that's only when you're using lucky. So I guess that's less of a problem now too. Because it would hit twice and crit twice. It used to be more of a problem. Good point to bring up. It used to be more. And that, that problem would still be there with the Marikath Legion Jewel. And the, the Slayer 8% base crit does not work with additional flat crit. So like I said, if you have above that, you're nerfing yourself. Right. So, Blind recently just got changed. Again, this isn't finalized, but uh, Blind used to be like the go-to defense. So just slap it in any build and you would just be in instantly safer. And now it causes targets to be 20% less accuracy rating and evasion rating. 
So it is literally of no defensive help to a build with a lot of armor, for example, but no evasion. Um, if you do have a lot of evasion, it's a very, very big. And it makes blind a lot less of a defensive buff, but it adds an offensive buff to the target having less evasion. So you have a higher chance to hit. Um, and that means that being blinded will cause you to be more susceptible to hits if you have evasion rating. So there are sources of cannot be blinded. You can get it in the Pantheon upgrade of Soul of Karakhan and um, Crafted Jewel Implicit and the Saboteur Ascendancy. And blind is still very good for evasion builds. So hit and critical strike chance. The game calculates your stats in the character panel against equal level white monsters, but with no modifiers on them. And that's why you'll like notice it'll, the numbers will go down the higher level you are because it'll be like, how strong are you versus X monster? So if you level from 50 to 51, it'll the, the numbers will go lower on your first mitigation and stuff. In-game crits is calculated against your hit chance and path of building lists effective critical strength chance as a function. So that will include things like Assassin's Mark, etc., which in-game will not. Critical strikes are rolled twice against hit chance. And if you miss, you cannot deal a critical strike. And if you hit but fail the critical roll, then a normal hit is dealt. And if you hit and succeed in the critical roll, then a critical hit is dealt. And again, this is why lucky would be bad because it would luck, luck twice and you would have to hit twice. Um, losing even a few points of hit chance has a large effect on your actual or effective crit rate. And 100% hit chance and 100% crit chance is 100% effective crit so you can't miss. So, here's some hit and crit strike math examples. 96% hit chance, 100% crit chance is 96% of the hits equals 96% crit. And you have a 92% effective crit chance here. 96% hit chance and 88% crit chance puts you down to an 84% effective crit rate. So you can see that it's very, very bad to not cap accuracy. Um, you learn this pretty fast when playing around in Path of Building because Path of Building will show accuracy is one of the highest damage mods when you aren't hit, hit capped. 85% hit chance and 77% crit chance. This might feel like really good numbers, right? Like they're very high. like, you know what? That's almost all the time hitting. But now we have a 65% effective crit rate and this is very low. If you're blinded, 85% hit chance and 77, then you're at a 54% effective crit rate. So again, very important and being immune to blind would be good as well. But yeah, and again, we are like just mathing this out. We don't have like everything yet and it's, is subject to change. So yeah, accuracy, very, very important. Armor, just got a bunch of changes and basically just a large amount of buffs. And uh, the in-game lies to you. If you look in-game, say you have a character with no endurance or just no... Well, I was about to say Basil Flask, but that's not around anymore, right? Sad. But uh, let's say you have 50,000 armor, it'll show you a very high percentage physical mitigation but there is no such thing from armor armor is linear and does not give what it says in game and there's no way for the player to know this except from third party knowledge um in game gives you an estimate of damage reduction against an equally leveled white monster with no modifier but it is taking small hits into account and armor mitigates physical damage from hits only it does not do anything against damage over time and the modifier type um, percentage additional physical damage over time is uh, a cap of 90%. And there's a very big difference between something like an endurance charge, which is 4%, no matter the size of a hit, versus armor, which is, um, yeah, linear. But it has diminishing returns based on the size of the hit multiplied by 5, and armor can never mitigate more than a tenth of the listed total armor value. And again, they might change this slightly, but... We don't know. Uh, from what they've said so far, they're not. Total reduction depends on both the incoming damage and your total armor rating. So the changes in 3.16 specifically is that if you had 10,000 armor previously and took 2,000 for damage, you would reduce that hit by 33%. Now you reduce that hit by 50%. So that's like a big buff for us. Armor is better now. But again, still works similarly where in-game it'll show a very high percentage, which will not be true. Uh, and that's important to know. So armor is still good, but it, it doesn't give you percentage mitigation. That's very important. 
So rule of thumb with the new armor formula is that if you want to get 50% mitigation against a physical damage hit, you need 5 times the damage as armor, where previously it required 10 times. <clears throat> Another example, if you want to mitigate a 5,000 damage hit down to 2,500, you used to need 50,000 armor. Now, you only need 25,000. So, huge buff. And this is the old armor scaling table. And you can see, um, like, we haven't made one for the new one yet. Obviously, these changes just dropped. But you can see, here's the old armor table. Um, and uh, it still gives you an idea, right? Here we have, like, the, the 20,000, etc. Like, you, you can see how linear it is. And yeah, rounding is usually decided in the monster's uh, favor. But, well, we're going to make a new uh, spreadsheet for this once everything is finalized and they decided... This is how they want to do it. But uh, very, very linear, not percentage-based. Important to know. Even as Sora sighted. Evasion. Also got... Um... Evasion. Well, I don't mean linear in that sense. I mean linear in like... It's just... Uh, maybe that's the wrong word. It's just... It's not based on... Percentage reduction like uh, endurance charges would be. It's uh, it's all about flat reduction. So it's very important. Yeah, damage, redu re damage reduced per point of armor is linear. Anyway, evasion also got changed a lot. Um, honestly, whether the evade... Like, the armor stuff is generally a straight off buff for us. Whereas the evasion changes is going to be a straight up buff for us. Needs to be mathed out and tried in practice a lot because normally you would have two different sources of mitigation because you would normally do dodge evasion builds, right? Um, you, you very rarely would have just an evasion build. But let's talk about just evasion right now. Evasion is against the attacker's accuracy and it's against attacks only. So um, chance to evade is currently capped at 95% and uh, it uses a system of entropy. And that was the main difference between evasion and dodge. And uh, if a player has a 1 in 4 chance to be hit, then the player will be hit exactly once every 4 consecutive attacks. Now, this is really, really good. Because that means that you will never have an unlucky streak with evasion. You will never get hit twice in a row. Ever. Um, but with, with like evasion, like it, it's, it's really good for us. Um, and based on some chance, because of entropy counter is randomized at the start and will be reset after a short amount of time. So the current estimate of time is 3.3 seconds or 100 server ticks. So it's, it, it makes it a very, very good, like, you very rarely, if ever, will get hit twice in a row with big hits. Um, now, obviously, something that could happen, as a quick example, you could get one large hit, two small quick ones, and then another large hit, for example. So that way it could be bad. If multiple monsters are attacking you, attacks of all monsters share the same counter, and the listed chance to evade is based on the average accuracy of a monster on the same level. Same reason you see that it's going down per level. So, the changes in 3.16 is to improve the evasion formula to get more chance to evade for all values of evasion rating. So, to have a 75% chance to evade tier 16 monsters, you would need 49% evasion before, and now you only need 24 and 75% uh, chance to evade tier 1 monsters, you would need 23,000 before. Now you only need 12,000. So you can see like all of these, like these numbers, definitely just a buff in our favor, right? The only big downside is that dodge is removed, so we don't have those like multiple layers anymore. Um, and yeah, getting high dodge should be pretty easy. There is no current information if the new cap is 75 or if that will stay at 95, but these were the examples they used. Attack dodge is completely removed from the game in 3.16 and that's why a lot of people are worried. Elusive has been changed to be 15% chance to avoid damage from hits instead of its old dodge related stats. We don't know what is happening to Quartz Flask. Quartz is currently pretty like almost mandatory in every build and not even just because of the dodge. It's just being stuck in monsters is a huge cause of death in the game. Very, very many deaths that happen both from streamers and stuff will be that they're getting stuck in things and that'll let people get hit. Um, spell dodge has been changed and only source of spell dodge will be the acrobatics keystone. And it no acrobatics no longer has any of its old properties, but now changes any modifier to spell suppression into spell dodge uh, at 50% of its value. And the intention is that acrobatics is the only source in the entire game for spell dodge. 
And that's for characters who want to benefit from that playstyle still. Spell dodge is capped at 75% and is not a random roll. So you could you could dodge 10 in a row or you could get hit 10 times in a row. Um, again, this is why comboing them was so nice, right? Because with evasion, there was no luck. It was entropy based. But with dodge and spell dodge, you could get lucky. So between the two of them, you were barely getting hit. And yeah, sorry, me. It is a random roll. It is a random roll. Not not a not not a random roll. Uh, and it's not affected by accuracy or blind. Spell suppression, new mechanic that is coming in 3.16. I initially thought this was going to be like some sort of like fortify for spellcasters, but it is a chance to half the spell damage taken, and you can get up to a hundred percent chance. And this is particularly strong once you do get close to hundred percent. And we'll have some examples too, but it will have passive and gear affixes. And uh, if you compare it to spell block and spell dodge, then supp suppression is a very predictable thing, right? If you're about to take a hundred thousand damage hit, or I, I don't think there is a hundred thousand damage hit, but I think the Maven explosion is seventy-two thousand or something. If you're about to take a hundred thousand damage hit, you would literally take fifty thousand, right? So it's not like armor that it depends on the size of the hit, no matter what, it halves it. Um, and and again, this would be a pretty big mechanic to get 100% on. It's not something I would want to leave at 80. And yeah, it's up to the player to choose between investing into um, that. And um, you can also like combo this with like other other sources of um, random, like block, for example. Manifesto intends that suppression is paired with evasion and you will have passives. So it will be very like ranger, ranger area focused, I would assume. Consider, considering most of the dangerous mechanics of bosses or spells, suppressions might be worth it for any bossing character if it's tank oriented. And yeah, like I said, like if you have 10 or if you have 20% spell suppression, it ends up being like 10% mitigation. But if you have 100%, it's 50% mitigation and you don't have to like worry. It's just you take half damage. It's really big. Huge. Right, block and glancing blows. They haven't said anything about changes to this. I was hoping glancing blows would get a buff, but blocking a hit prevents all damage and negative on hit effect, like ailments, curses, etc. Um, I think it blocks curses at least. And it must be hit to execute a block. It does nothing against damage over time. So dot builds can like get through that. Random rolls, it's not affected by entropy. So the base block chance is 0%. And then you have a 15% block chance uh, while dual wielding. And the base block chance when using a shield or staff is the implicit value. Natural cap is 75% for both block and spell block. And there's additional sources of maximum block. Gladiator versatile combatant for 4%. Unique amulet the anvil for 3%. And shield corruption implicit for 1%. And you can also corrupt the anvil. Block is the strongest when combined with on block modifiers. You want to like things like recover life or energy shield on block. Mana on block as well can be really good for minor or matter builds. And yeah, block is just very, very strong with that. And that makes it much better to combine with glancing blows as well. And you gain a random charge when you block can be really good as well. And yeah, the, the life on block makes glancing blows way better. And Blocking and blocking glancing blows. So glancing blows doubles your block chance, but causes you to take 65%. 65% of the damage of the blocked hit. Does nothing for a hit that was not blocked. But this on general means that you're taking more damage. I generally will not take glancing blows unless I have life on block. Like if you don't have on block benefits, I would never take glancing blows anymore. Um, it's very important to either have flat life on block, percentage life on block, um, necromancer, very, very big because necromancer gets loads of life on block and you can get there. Like there's multiple sources. You can get flat life on block as a stat. You can get the percentage life. You can get bone offering life on block. Really, really good. And without that, glancing blows is pretty rough. So we have some examples, assuming that you take a hundred hits of a thousand damage. 25% base block chance and no glancing blows means that you take 75,000 damage over 100 hits. 
Um, here we have 25% blaze blo base block and glancing blows. You take 82, sorry, <clears throat> 82,000 damage over 100 hits. So you can see that glancing blows. We're taking quite a lot more damage here. 55 base block and no glancing blows equals 45,000 damage taken over 100 hits. And with glancing blows, 73,000. So again, you really do need to mitigate the glancing blows. It's very important to have life on block or percentage life on block. Very, very important. If you aren't benefiting from being block cap, just be like raw, raw, natural block. It's very, very important. Mana reservation, and it just got changed massively. It's now going to be called mana reservation efficiency. This is something where I could see some of the numbers being changed. Um, just like, especially fine tuning on uniques and stuff like that. I don't know if they're going to be staying the way they said. But we'll see. Scales the same as any other additive increase and decrease modifier, and the benefit per point is higher the less you have. This makes it very, very good for if you're somebody that plays alone. The new mana reservation changes are amazing. If you were somebody that built builds that had multiple auras, like 5 to 10, 15, this is terrible for you. <coughs> huh. Right. So, simplifies the mana reservation calculations. And it's very easy now. It's very easy to figure out. So, restoring 100% of mana, right? You don't need anything. You can always do that. Restoring 165% mana requires 65% efficiency. Restoring 200% mana requires 100% efficiency. Flat mana restoration is going to be a bit more complicated than that, but the percentage wise is going to be very easy. Mana. mana most efficiency modifiers are only going to affect mana, but they are still keeping some that are global. Um, so you will have mana reservation efficiency versus reservation efficiency. And I'm sure there will be a few life reservation efficiency. So we have reservation efficiency affecting life currently known like Prism Guardian, Skyforth, Memory Vault, and Essence Worm. They're global. Jewel Corruptions as well. And... Honestly, again, if you're playing solo, the efficiency changes is going to be very, very good. And especially for Spell Slinger. Spell Slinger is basically getting an absolute massive buff this league. Now, it remains to be seen. Maybe they are uh, maybe they are listening to community being excited for Spell Slinger saying, Haha, not today, and nerfing Spell Slinger in other ways. But uh, if they don't touch Spell Slinger, it's a massive buff. Alright, let's talk about order operations on receiving damage. And... If it, in a simplified order of operations, first damage conversion, then reduced and less damage taken, then critical avoidance, then evasion, then dodge, then damage shift. Um, and talking about damage shift, this is basically like chaos damage taken as physical, um, and then uh, physical damage taken as elemental, etc. Now, the problem here, you can never shift damage twice, and that's very important to know. I actually died because of that. Because you can convert damage given twice. You can do um, like cold to lightning and lightning to fire, for example, right? With Avatar Fire. Things like that. But you can never shift damage twice. Why is dodge in the list? Spell dodge. Um, so the difference here is that, for example, if you have uh, physical damage taken as fire, you cannot take that fire damage as, as chaos. Uh, no, you can do lightning to fire with uh, avatar fire. Um, but yeah, you cannot do that. So it's um, very, very important that you remember you can only shift damage taken once. Very, very important. Um, this could end up killing you. It ended up killing me because I used a keystone called Zabakwa, which is elemental damage taken. Oh, right. Uh, it's elemental damage taken as um, chaos. And then I stacked loads of physical damage taken as elemental to then hopefully disjoint that to chaos again for even more safety and i died um it was still very tanky just i we masked it out to be borderline immortal um so again very important cannot shift damage taken twice then next up we have avoid armor and flat reductions and resistance damage taken as block then guard skills es ward mana and life is the last thing So all category stack and relying on just a singular method will generally be detrimental because, yeah, you will eventually get hard, hit hard enough to die. Very important in Path of Exile to have a layered defense. Very, very important. 
Are there any questions pertaining to advanced mechanic or defense? And hopefully you guys enjoyed the lesson. Obviously, Path of Exile defenses is a little bit complicated. Wait, what's the difference between damage conversion and shift? Huh? So, damage conversion is if an enemy does, like, lightning as fire. Right? I think that's the first thing that happens. It's what the enemy does. Damage shift is if you do something. So, for example, as a, as a map mod, right? You could have uh, physical damage as extra fire. And then shift would be, like, lightning coil. Yeah. I have a question more specifically. How will the 3.16 changes affect Righteous Fire? Has nothing to do with this. I'm sorry, dude. Nothing to do with defenses. Yes, this will be on YouTube. Does block work with the get a charge when you're hit mod on flask? Yes. Should do. Did you cover what increased global defenses impacts? No. So global defenses will affect energy shield, ward, armor, and evasion. No. No, not yet, Warlock. No news about hardened scars. Can you take CI and convert all LA damage taken to chaos for a chunky boy? Yes. So a good example of this is uh what's the um what's the uh what's the chest called? It's uh, the same base as Chains of Command. Incandescent Heart, thank you. So, Incandescent Heart is a good example of this. So, this is obviously a very low energy shield, right? 327, but it does have 25% of elemental damage from hits taking this scale. So, it basically ends up being a 500, 550 ES base with armor on it. Um, if you are a CI build. So, it's actually a very, very good alternative. And, um, yeah. Very, very good. Does mom give you 30% damage reduction or is it remove 30% of damage taken? No, it lets you take the damage to your life to your mana instead. Is it true that when a pack of monsters attack you simultaneously, dodges roll a single time for the whole pack rather than for each individual monster? That's on evasion. So the, the counter is rolled for the entire pack, yes. If multiple monsters are attacking you, attacks of all monsters share the same counter. And that's to make it so that each monster doesn't have its own individual counter. Um, and it's shared. The reason for that is so, so that it says the, the counter is a 1 in 4 to get hit. It won't be a different monster with a 1 in 3. So if there are are four monsters and it rolls a one in four counter, one of those attacks is going to hit you. Yes, it resets and, and keeps like uh, every 100 server ticks or every 3.33 seconds. So, what are the best order of defense investments? The Some of the strongest things for defense in the game, like endurance charges, are insane value because it's always a 4% damage reduction. It's also um, resistances, which can be scary on hardcore to, to balance your gear around. But yeah, endurance charges, it's insane value. Things like Taste of Hate is insane value for fist mitigation because very often you'll get high elemental resistances and they're making getting higher max stress even better this league. Um, so for example, say you have 0% physical mitigation, right? But you get 10% physical damage taken as cold. You have at least 75% cold rest, right? So instead of that, a thousand damage being mitigated with zero, it gets mitigated 
10% uh, of it gets mitigated against 75. So it's very, very strong. Fortify is changing, so yeah. Well, Dragon Blasts are still very important for your changes uh, or for your defenses, but before, blasts could literally be your entire mapping defense. It isn't anymore. Um, armor and evasion is a lot more important now for your mapping defense. Bosses in general, bosses are honestly in Path of Exile, bosses are very telegraphed, right? Think of like things like Shaper and the Shaper Slam. Everything there is, is you can very reasonable to avoid it. The the biggest thing that you need layer defenses for is mapping because there's so many sources attacking you at once, things coming out of nowhere, and more importantly, it's a lot harder for you, the player, to um to anticipate things in maps. And there's new league mechanics. They're also not a bosses, right? Um, and Path of Exile does a really poor job of, of showing you what is a dangerous move, unless you already know it, right? There is sometimes like really, really big moves in Path of Exile. So an example I like to use is the Delve Plasma Ball from one of the wolf creatures, right? It's huge. It covers the entire screen and it looks like it should one hit your character. It moves like this slowly across the screen, just like 30 damage. And then you have like a little like sand pia from a Mariketh archer that will literally do 16,000 damage. You have the small spiders in Delve that explode for 16,000 damage. Six consoles. It's just dude, insane amounts of damage from small sources. And it makes it really, really hard that unless you literally know this is what you have to worry about, it'll destroy you. Another good example is at the start of the Heist League, there were small circles on the ground that were literally one-hitting us. And we're like, <laughs> and then in Expedition, you have circles on the ground that don't, don't, don't do nothing. They're basically cosmetic. So, it's, it's a very, very hard in Path of Exile to really anticipate what's going to kill you in a map. Whereas bosses is very telegraphed. Generally, in a boss fight, you very quickly learn what is dangerous, what isn't. Um, so yeah, very, very important to have strong mapping defenses. And armor is very good now. Armor is very good for mapping. Um, things like things like dodge was always very good. And I loved having a bit of evasion and, and dodge, spell dodge, etc. Especially things like porcupines. A little bit of avoidance it goes a very long way. But yeah, we are going to end the episode of Path of Exile University there. Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, Steel Mage's episode has been moved to tomorrow, but I hope you guys enjoyed this. And uh, yeah, more tomorrow. A lot tomorrow. And then the day after that, we have a Q&A with Nuugi as well. So thanks for watching. Hope you guys are enjoying. Sub if you like the channel. But more importantly, try to die. Less than